Hi, everybody. Welcome to our, our virtual South by Southwest panel. Well, we're all wishing we could be in, in Austin, Texas, at the South by Southwest. We're so grateful to be able to, to be together virtually from, from all over the country and for you all to be able to join us. Um, we're honored to be today by some amazing game changers in hemp. Um, these, these women are, are individuals and companies who are not only pioneers in bringing amazing consumer hemp products to the market, but also in working to, to change the laws to bring hemp out of prohibition and to squash outdated misconceptions about the plant. And through their lenses, we can learn about the state of the industry what it's taken to get here today and the unique challenges we've had behind us and ahead of us. Um, we're grateful to be joined today by, by Kelly Fair, the U.S. General Counsel for Canopy Growth Corporation, which is the largest cannabis company in the world and who has been navigating the many legal obstacles and shaping some of the most important laws and policies behind the scenes to bring compliant hemp products to market um, in the U.S. And, and all over the world. We're also honored to be joined by the, the Willie's Remedy team on a, a very special day, Willie Nelson's 87th birthday. I think I have that right. Um, Elizabeth Hogan, the, the co-founder and VP of GCH Inc., which is the lifestyle brand, Willie's Reserve Cannabis and Willie's Remedy Hemp Brands, um, inspired by the only Willie Nelson. And so honored to be joined by the amazing Annie Nelson, um, also co-founder of the Willie Nelson brand and Longtime advocate with her husband for hemp, cannabis, the environment, farmers, um, and is so kind to join us today, especially on his 87th birthday. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I think he's somewhere in the background celebrating there, so <laughs> his presence is, is felt here by all. Um, so we'll, we'll jump in here. I really want to kind of start by where, where did everyone come from? come from as far as their, their mission and purpose with hemp. And, and Kelly, I'll start with you. What What is Canopy's mission with hemp and what has had to change in the law and in society and culture to make this mission happen? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, people mostly know Canopy as you know the largest cannabis company in the world. So it can get a little confusing when I say, well, no, Canopy is not a cannabis company in the US, um, but we are not for a very technical reason. We're not allowed to violate any US federal laws in any of the, I think, 12 countries where we operate. Um, but hemp was a very special opportunity for all of us, Canopy included. Um, our, our jumping off point into the US market was the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill and the federal legalization of hemp. Um, that moment meant that Canopy could come in um, as a hemp operator. Uh, for me, that was very exciting. I'd already been uh, working in the cannabis industry since 2014 um, and getting to jump in on a new frontier industry that had federal legalization was, was quite interesting. Um, so Canopy jumped in uh, for the federally legal product. Um, and then it also, opened up um, the opportunity for Canopy to join in the discussion around federal legalization of cannabis in a way that was more sincere since we do now have skin in the game, at least for some part of the cannabis plant, the federally legal side, we're able to leverage our resources as a hemp operator, which really um, we can get into later, but plays more to the conservative side of the political spectrum um, without being a cannabis operator and then really be able to start uh, pushing the education towards cannabis to those folks that are pro hemp and anti cannabis. Um, so that's, you know, broad brushstrokes, how Canopy got here, um, why we're excited about hemp, why we continue to be excited about hemp, um, and advocating for the industry. What's had to change? Um, I think that, you know, the, the farm bill was a jumping off point, but it gave jurisdiction to regulate the industry to the USDA and the FDA. The USDA, I think, has done a tremendous job in opening itself up to regulate quickly, to be open to stakeholders. And so that um, that partnership was there right out of the gate. The FDA side um, that's kind of holding up the hemp derived products and putting a, a bit of a cloud over that piece of the supply chain and industry that that still needs to change. And that's that's uh, spade work that we're working hard to accomplish as well as other stakeholders. 
does canopy source all of its hemp from from the U.S. Um, we know that it, it operates internationally, and that the, the laws are different different everywhere. Yes, ma'am. Um, we came into the U.S. Uh, cultivating all of our own hemp. We we planted it in seven states in the 2019 growing season. I think we put about 4,500 acres in the ground for that season, and so we have. Um, more than enough at this point to supply our, our hemp derived manufacturing operations. And I, f I find that in the US, the kind of quality that you can grow if you're looking for those high CBD yielding plants um, is above what you can get in some other countries. Um, and, and it can be more, it's more reliable being able to hold um, that, that part of the supply chain um, to, pr to very strict scrutiny and have transparency around testing and around um, labeling when you know that the hemp is grown in the U.S., your, your chances of having uh, a clean product at the end uh, is higher. And this is for Elizabeth and for Annie. The, the Nelson family has been longtime advocates for for hemp and, and farmers, and particularly family farmers. How did this lead to the genesis of, of Willie's Remedy? Say it again. Sorry, I have some final chess players behind me, and I couldn't hear you. Um, I think that you, the family, the Nelson family, has been longtime advocates for hemp and family farmers. And how did that lead to the birth of of Willie's Remedy? And maybe tell us a little bit about mm. what this Remedy is. Well, about three and a half decades ago, we started Farm Aid, so we've been doing that. Anything of course, to benefit the farmer, which hemp is, uh, farmer and soil and environment, et cetera, et cetera. But fast forward to, I don't even remember, I 2002, something like that. We got involved with um, some friends of ours on Maui, uh, Kelly and Bob King, they have Pacific Biodiesel. And so we started looking for ways to coordinate benefits for farmers with with um, biodiesel, sustainable biodiesel. Um, and not just like palm biodiesel, any of those kind of things, renewable, sustain, renewable and sustainable biodiesel. So we formed the um, Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance and through that promoted the idea of hemp and several other crops. We said food first, so it was always gonna be that. And um, that got us in, into that arena and, and seeing how uh, hemp would benefit some of the problems that farmers were having with soil and soil remediation. Um, we just started trying to push it and make it uh, a real reality. And then through that, um, I, met, I have a friend, uh, Michael Bowman, who had the first Colorado uh, crop of hemp legal. And he worked with the Stanleys. And apparently he had had, I had been making chocolates for quite some time for my husband and um, Michael gave it to another friend who said, hey, these are great, let's do this, market them. And it ended up being, we went through a series of people who didn't have kind of our ideals until we found our GCH group, which is um, Willie's, we formed Willie's Remedy with. And it was still even at that point all about how can we make this right for farmers as well as people who want to consume cannabis or, or CBD derived hemp or even hemp products? So the hemp products was an issue too. We had a, we started a company years ago with uh, Woody Harrelson, Ziggy Marley and Willie. It was WWW, WWZ, <laughs> that's what it was. Um, but it was hard to find, we were making clothing and it was hard to find hemp well, there was no hemp in, in the U.S., no legal hemp in the U.S. And we actually put on our tag to educate. We had the educational point uh, of saying um, not made in America, but should be and could be. And so to, to further the conversation, it's just evolved from all of that. And, and each little door that opened, opened several more doors. That's sort of the way it works anyway. But um, the advocacy piece was really trying to merge uh, benefits for farmers with benefits for humans who, other humans who wanted to um, consume. And so that's what we ended up doing. 
and that's how we got started in this. It was just basically from that con connection and wanting to make that connection work. That was, that's us. That's our story. There's not a lot to it. It's just that we happened to run into some decent people who felt that ha that were on the same you know, integrity point as us about what, how we move forward. And so we did. And here we are. Amazing. Yeah, I, I think people sometimes don't understand what it's taken to get where we are today and still how far we have to go. Um, um, and just the, the education that needed to happen with lawmakers and policymakers in the public about what, what hemp is and that it's you know not just the cannabis plan and it's in fact not marijuana, it's, it's farming and jobs and, yeah. and the environment. And, um, and the environment, the regenerative piece is super, super huge. I mean, it took three jail terms, three arrests, three legal fees. Thank you guys. Um, but to, you know, to keep putting, I mean, to put it out there, it wasn't like he went to get arrested, but, but each time it made people realize, I mean, my guy, he's 87. It's not like it's going to kill you. And the, the hemp piece of it, it's sort of everybody activating their endocannabinoid system is a, especially right now is a huge bonus. So, but the regenerative piece of that for land was um, that real common ground, that literally common ground that we had with the farmer and consumer. Yeah. And it seems like much of the market is focused on, on CBD and there's starting to be more research on phytoremediation and um, making t textiles and biofuels and other industrial products, but it, I understand we have a lot of work to do and a lot of infrastructure to put in place to get that part of the industry um, you know, op operable in the U.S. And do you see that there's a, a future for expansion of kind of the industrial side of hemp um, for Canopy or, or for Willys? And is that something that maybe people need to start thinking about more significantly now as we enter into sort of this kind of recession where it is more about jobs and how are we going to ensure the survival of these farmers and the survival of this hemp industry, which is brand new and, and now entering into, you know, a, a recession and some really unique challenging times. Um, I, I mean, I can, I'll defer to Annie, who's been closer to the, the, the clothing side and the textile side. Um, but from our perspective, uh, it became very clear to me at the very beginning that, you know, we haven't grown this crop at scale in this country for over a hundred years. And when you talk about industrial applications of hemp, you're talking about a different hemp crop than you are when you're talking about hiring CBD. I mean, just, I gave, I gave a nice visualization, I thought, to when I was testifying um, on the interim final rules for the USDA, it's like you think of a hiring CBD crop as something that looks like a crisp tree, that you know, the fiber crops can grow over 20 feet tall. Um, and that's what you want to be able to have a really robust textile operation or you know, putting it into the door panels of cars, all of that and all of the amazing opportunity for the plant. But to get there, we do need infrastructure and we, we need R&D around the decortication methods and how you, how you pulp out that big plant, how you harvest that big plant. It takes a different, even at the farming level, uh, pieces of equipment to harvest something that big. So a lot of work to be done, but I've always thought that there's just um, such a high opportunity there. Um, and having some a, a fiber like that that is sustainable um, is amazing. And that's that's where I'd want to turn it to you, Annie. Because sustainable and renewable. And you know, and the issue is it's not just that. I mean, out of that, out of that, the fiber comes the the oils the food the you know all of the ancillary products it's not just that but the bagasse the you know to to for building for insulation for all of those things it, it you can make one thing and have ancillary product from the one thing that you make that you can then you know market but for farmers this could be a lifesaver especially right now i mean right now farmers are in trouble and it's not just it's not it's Industrial ag is, which could be a great new shift, the paradigm shift. But at the same time, the, the idea that, um, that 
uh, uh, small family farmers, uh, you know, are are struggling. This could this could actually be um, a saving grace because of all of the benefits that and all the ancillary products you can get from it. It's really huge. In you know, it needs to be done. When and I down with Annie um, and Willie uh, at our very first meeting, uh, we were laser beam focused on the opportunity in the marijuana market. It was 2014. And that was what the, you know, the headline in every newspaper was about the marijuana market. And Annie and Willie reminded us three times in the conversation that cannabis is a plant, is, is a family of plants and that, that both sides of the family have something important to offer. And for me, that was really enlightening. Not that I had never thought about it, but it was coming from this, you know, uh, magnetic voice of the, the weed world saying, no, 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 it's a bigger story. And I think that weed has done that for Cousin Hemp. And I, I Sean, thank you for getting us all together today. And I want to say like uh, one thing that, um, that we've learned like working with Sean on some of these issues is that all of the attention and the energy and the momentum that, that comes around this exciting new frontier of cannabis legalization can be channeled to some of these issues in hemp. And um, I think, I, I really think, Sean, one of the things that that uh, that has been so, so interesting over the last couple of years about all of our conversations and the work and the projects is that it's about how do we use either the momentum or the resistance happening in the, the other side of the cannabis conversation to advance this side, which has so much additional potential. Pushing so, ants, it's going with it. Can uh -huh. I make one thing, one little observation correction maybe? It hasn't been a hundred years. My husband, who's 87, during, when he was a kid in the FFA in here in Abbott, Texas, and just north of Waco, was growing hemp for the war. They were making rope with it for his ships. He was growing hemp for World War II. It, it's not like n nobody knew, and I know, you know, it's not a big mystery to anybody who's probably listening to this because you've probably done some research or you wouldn't be interested. But, you know, the the whole idea around stills and prohibition, a lot of that, the the removal of stills was that people were growing their own fuel. They, they were growing cannabis, sunflower, all kinds of things from their crop. They were taking oil and running their diesel tractor engines because the diesel engine was designed to run on peanut and hemp oil. And so the, 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 uh, the hundred year thing, maybe you can back it off a little bit, but the point is well taken that it's ridiculous that it's, it's, it's been this long. To, to come back to a non-hallucinogenic plant. But at the same time, there, there were reasons that it's gone that are still in some people's heads that, that goes to Elizabeth's point of, you know, kind of using pushing hands where you see where people are coming from and push them there and back into a circle of fact sometimes because sometimes they're coming from that sort of reefer madness. Um, mentality but but when you when you do educate people about the potential of hemp and potential for farmers here especially texas in the south where they lost cotton crops to flooding and you know it's sort of nationwide you can see that 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 remediation of the soil in itself is a product uh, an ancillary product we need topsoil we need soil we need healthy soil this everything canopy is doing growing that er, whatever you use that for it's still good for the soil just start there starting with just the roots and working up so yeah i mean i i just agreeing with you but saying maybe back it up just a, a 30 25 years because he did grow it they grew it yeah no, that's a, it's a fantastic point. It is a fantastic point. Um, just to piggyback on something um, that Elizabeth said that's interesting to me, hearing you say, you know, hemp, the, the little cousin of weed, um, which is so true because hemp's coming onto the scene so much later. And then from my view, um, I'm seeing that that little cousin is just such a powerful vehicle to get into, you know, our, our more conservative uh, leadership, get in, I can walk into those offices where if I was advocating for cannabis, 
I would not be invited, mm -hmm. but I'm in, and I'm in in some of the most conservative counties. I mean, you wouldn't believe some things I heard at the early, the early start of our education campaign of, you know, hemp is a gateway to heroin. I heard that from a, a local council, I won't say where, but they ended up with a few, after a few weeks, being our biggest partners in one of our largest grows in California. And it, all they needed to know was it doesn't get you high. And then, oh, we're all in for hemp, cannabis is evil. But it, now we have this partnership. So as we're trying to flip that county from red to green on cannabis, we have those relationships. So it's just like this miraculous Trojan horse. There's a lot of power there, even though the, the industry is still in its nascent years in this, I guess it's in its 4.0. I mean, wherever we are in, in mm -hmm. history with this gorgeous plant. That's brilliant. Foot in the door. That's right. Foot in the door, whatever it takes to educate. No, that's a great point. And our experience too, when we worked with, with Willie's and Canopy in, in Texas, it was, they didn't even really want Willie's name in, in front of the issue because of his association with marijuana. And we had so much pushback. And then as soon as it was legal, it was all, oh, Willie Nelson's was involved. And, you know, everyone was so all proud of it. All those people that have been on our bus. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I, I think, too, it's really setting the stage in important, um, you know, regulatory considerations right now. I mean, we're, we're all waiting on the FDA to determine its regulatory approach over CBD and other hemp derived cannabinoids. And this seems like it's undoubtedly going to set the stage for how marijuana products and marijuana derived cannabinoids are ultimately regulated at the federal level. And, you know, it's, as Elizabeth said, kind of tagging along to each other. This is a way in which we're starting to have to educate and inform federal regulators and policymakers about what this plan is and what are terpenes and how do we regulate these things and what is in fact its safety profile where we may not have gotten there for years and years um, with just marijuana. For sure, we spend. I think at this point, um, you know, our, our Willie's Remedy brand is the is the one that's all the hemp derived products, and um, you know, based on really great advice, we've we've opted in to follow regulations that don't actually apply to us yet. And I bet you guys are doing the same thing. We're you know where it's um, choose the playbook of um, the arena in which you want to play. Start following those rules show that you belong, right? And then work your way there. And we've been doing that in a self-regulated manner and uh, not to air too much of what that's like, but uh, ow, it <laughs> hurts. It's really, really, really challenging to what to do to, to, to make those trade-offs, um, you know, coming back to what's the mission. Because part of it for us is clearly that part of the mission is to bring these plants together um, in terms of perception and understanding, because that's, that's, that, that's, that's thing number one, and that's kind of what we're you know, all saying works together. Uh, but that you can't jump to that as the goal. And so in the meantime, it's, okay, we are not gonna say CBD, because if we say CBD, they can come after us for saying CBD. So we get around that. And then, you know, now it's, um, it, it's navigating what we need to do to be on shelves in grocery. And that's a new set of requirements. And it is, uh, it's funny. I don't know, um, Annie, if you are, are chafing at that at all, but it's, it's a lot more, <laughs> it's a lot of rules for an yeah. alpha spirited brand to try to, uh, <laughs> bring to market. It's interesting because it's not just for us. It's so far. It's not just um, the you know the regulators and in that arena. It's also like in Hawaii, we're having an issue right now with uh, one of only or the, with two. Dis we only have two dispensaries so um, on Maui, but. Um, the licensing is so dicey for cannabis that they want to they want to include CBD. Like they want to control your federally legal CBD sales, and so that's a whole nother fight. That's a whole nother legal battle. But because you have to fight them to prove that that you're right, they're wrong. You still have to go to court. It's just re it's kind of ridiculous, but it's each little step. I, you know, you remind yourself each time you go in, each little step is a step forward, you know, and it's and it's an opportunity really to educate the public too about 
CBD. And through that, I'm, it, it's a gateway in, it, in that it's an education point. So once people learn about CBD, they can decide whether whether uh, they need a combination of something or not. But the CBD tends to be something that people seek out. They feel better, especially people my age, you know. Okay, my husband's age, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm old too. But. Now, and to that, to that point, I think I mean, Canopy and Willie's both have consumer products that I think when you see on the shelf, people may assume, you know, are just as easy to get to market as any other product, but maybe tell us a little bit about, maybe Kelly starting with you, what is the Canopy's kind of first and free brand and, and hemp line and um, what are the hemp components of these products and can you just get these products to market as if it were another consumer product? Yeah, easy, easy breezy. Um, so we do, we have launched our first line. It's it's first and free. Um, I think it's a, a, a tremendous brand. We've got other brands in, in the pipeline um, that will follow uh, and they are ingestibles like oils, soft gels um, and topicals of what we've offered so far. And, you know, as Elizabeth said, to be able to wear, wear a clean hat into up on, you know, the hill, you have to be advocating for the FDA to regulate these ingestible products like dietary supplements. And so to do that, you must follow the CFR's regulations for dietary supplements. And it's not easy. It's not easy to require um, GMP manufacturing. Um, it's not easy to follow the patchwork of state regulations for how you label a product and then also overlay the new commercial policies about how you can market that product. Well, if you can say CBD or not, can you say CBD and still be advertised by Google or sold on Amazon? Like there's a, there is a lot of, of hurdles that are put in place because of um, the FDA slow reaction to regulate. Uh, I think that right now, um, coming out of the COVID crisis, um, it might be a tipping point for the industry to be putting the pressure on Congress, who has already been putting pressure on the FDA. And we might be looking at a legislative fix sooner than later, where they're just going to amend the FDCA and include drives, um, cannabinoids as part of the dietary supplement definition. I would not be surprised if that is uh, a net result coming out of this, as our country you know, looks for industries um, to be a shot in the arm for the economy. Um, our industry wants so badly to be that boost. What we're asking for is regulation, um, where a lot of other industries are struggling and what they're asking for is cash. We don't need the cash. This won't cost the government a dime. It just, we need the regulation. Um, so that's probably more than. Roro. <laughs> oh, I think, yeah. Did, did we lose Kelly? Kelly, turn your button, button. I think you might be on mute. She was right at the crux of it too. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> it's really super important while she's fixing it. This this is why why voting is so important. The changes that we've had just in the last what um, really five years in in a bulk group have made such a huge difference in in advancing. Kelly, you're back. Oh no, there. Where'd she go? Anyway, it, that that voting is, is a is of the utmost importance if we want to keep moving everything forward. If we want to help, you know, small business. If we want to help farmers. If we want to help small family farmers, especially. If we want to help those people, then voting matters. And vote for people who understand that this plant is is part of our DNA, literally part of our DNA, and that it's something we need. No, I amen to that. And, and I think too, people really need to be educated transparently about what's in these products and what the benefits are. And in this crisis and coming out of this crisis, you know, focusing on wellness is has almost a, a whole new meaning is going to be more important than ever. And um, there's 
so many benefits of, of hemp as an ingredient in, in teas and in tinctures and, and topicals and, and all the various products. And the current regulatory status is prohibiting businesses from really talking about the the truth as to, to what these products are and having to get creative as, as as you all have done so well. But obviously there, you know, there's volumes of data, you know, proving the the, the wellness benefits of these products and probably look to Willie Nelson himself on his 87th birthday, like Still these going. products have to be <laughs> <laughs> but it does matter as she was she was making a point both she and Elizabeth that it it, it matters the the regul it, certain regulation matters and certain testing matters because if you're going to advance this and it is supposed to be wellness I always say you are what you eat but you are what you eat eats so we need to know that it's it's clean what you're getting that not only is it clean, but it's processed properly, that you're getting a whole flower, you're getting all the, you know, that it's sustainably produced and that it's sustainable to your body. And so those things do matter. And, and it, it keeps, you know, the, the ones that are out there, like, uh, like Kelly said, for cash, it keeps them from destroying a market that can be such a great benefit to this country, especially right now. And I'm back, everyone. Sorry about that. I had to, I had to reload. Did you have um, to lose the gold? Uh, no, I'm back. I'm oh, back, back with the gold. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, well, uh, I was just making, continuing your point, but you got to like the, the culmination of what you were saying. I know. And I, I think the, the final piece of that was like, you have to, you have to let us get our sea legs and really be able to make the impact realize that, you know, 10 billion, $20 billion market. I mean, everybody's got their projections, but we can't realize that and we can't be that shot in the arm to the economy. If we don't have a, a fair place to play and to Annie's point to knock out some of these fly by night, um, products and manufacturers that are just doing the quick, cheap, easy, dangerous thing for a consumer, um, knowing that there are no regulations. And if they get a, an FDA letter, you know, they'll just shut down and pop up some other bad brand. Um, so if we, if we get that sort of stability, then those players are just going to lose their interest probably in the industry yeah. altogether. Yeah, it deflects. We want to attract. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I think to Annie's point earlier, this is a, a critical time to be reaching out to to state representatives and supporting organizations who are, you know, trying to push this forward um, on a congressional level and with with state regulators. And there's an opportunity now, but there's also a real crisis now, and this might, you know, mean survival or not for some small farmers. And um, you know what. What else can we be doing to to support the small farmers and to make sure this industry is structured to include them? I know there's a lot of concern about how the DEA or the USDA regulations came out and the significant DEA involvement in those regulations. You know how easy it, it is to grow hot hot non-compliant hemp. Um, you know the law enforcement is still so confused and educated about the issue that it's just so risky for farmers. And is that something you guys are experiencing in practice with your brands and your companies? And do you think that that is going to re require change with USDA, DEA, everybody? Can, what, what can we do to, to some solutions here? Well, I mean, I, I do think um, I was very involved with the USDA's interim final rule. The canopy was the only stakeholder to testify on those rules. Fairly so, we hadn't seen them. So I basically just talked about every single thing that I could for as long as um, OMB would let me. Um, but once they hit, once they hit in October, um, I found that the USDA was very open to stakeholders in a way that um, only regulators that want their industry to survive do. And they listened to the DEA issue and they listened to Senator Wyden um, and the call from Oregon to say, there's not enough of these testing facilities. There will never, they're not going to be enough of these testing facilities. The DEA um, can be quite obstructionist. And the USDA has backed off that, at least for the, the 2020 growing season or is taking a pause to, to rethink it. So I, I think that the more 
the more the farmers and the farming um, industry as in their trade associations can continue to lobby and the stakeholders can continue to lobby for fair growing, it will help the farmers and help the manufacturers in the end. I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, right now I'm seeing a disparate result um, in the hemp industry as a whole. It's broken into two now. It's like along the supply chain, you've got the, the hemp commodity operators, the farmers all the way through extraction, and then you've got the hemp product operators, and they're treated so differently by their two regulating bodies. But if you get the FDA to regulate properly, then it, it, that benefit trickles all the way back to the farmers because the yields that you get on those high CBD crops are, or the margins are much higher. And so then those farmers are incentivized to grow the more expensive crops, we're incentivized to buy them, and the ecosystem works as one industry instead of like an industry broken into two different regulators and two different treatments. Yeah, is there a lot, and, and then implementing vertical integration in, into that that um, certification, the FDA, the USDA, if they could have that model, then, then it would be symbiotic. You could vertically integrate your crop starting farmers. Farmers can be growing stuff and, and having ancillary crop too from hemp, but at the same time, and plus getting the benefit of the uh, soil remediation. But then then if it does require what Kelly was saying, it's it's got to, it, there's got to be some sort, sort of um, uh, cohesion in, in uh, uh, regulation. And to do that, honestly, I, I just think that voting is our best weapon. You know, oh, it's a great point. Um, and you see, you can see the leaders um, on the Senate side, the congressional side, you watch them flip when their constituents flip um, and how impactful the grassroots campaigns are on hemp issues and cannabis issues right now. And now that hemp is so popular amongst the conservatives um, in states that are anti-cannabis to really put those, those campaigns um, into those states. Um, while we know as a, as a country, we're at the tipping point for cannabis. I know this isn't about cannabis, but I think that the two industries um, will, will, will concede, succeed together in the end. So, um, and the more relief on the, the cannabis side, the more relief, because there's no relief. There you go. There's, a, um, there's less pressure and it, it, it will become easier and it will flow easier. It's just huge that that, that, that happened, that we push for people who, can, who have that vision and elect them, and then we get to have the USDA and the FDA that we need, and it all eventually goes away. Yeah. Anyway, that's the picture I'm putting in my bubble, and you all do too, too <laughs> is that we make the change the way we're supposed to make the change, and you know, getting our foot in the door, to educate, educating, and voting. Those are, those are huge. You have to have a fair product. You have to educate people about that product. And then you, ha you have to encourage people to vote for their own best interest. Totally agree. And what do you think in all these years you all have been advocating and, and educating um, on hemp, on cannabis, what are some lessons learned that we can carry forward um, in this next phase? Persist. It's, it's, it, you know, it's the answer. It's always the answer. But when you know you're right and you have a product that that literally, honestly, and I, I've said it before, it's part of our DNA. We need to to make sure that we just keep pushing for what is right. And Elizabeth and Kelly said earlier, you know, however you get your foot in the door, get your foot in the door and then change minds by showing them. You know, you can't beat somebody up and say, believe this. You have to show them. And if, it, you know, there's a lot of people that that are closet um, closet supporters, even rural people. First off, they want the can. Uh, they want hemp. They want hemp. They, they want cannabis to be legal. They know it. They grew up in the 60s like me. You know, they know it's not going to kill you. It's not going to do all those things. But at the same time, they, they, they're old enough and have experienced all this stuff and they can see that 
there's more to it than just this, that now there's there, we've sequenced the genome for THC. We've se sequenced the genome for C CBD. I mean, we know that these things can medicinally work. And then hemp, everybody, you can get um, hemp, hemp bags, hemp, everything. It's, they're, they're, it's not a demon crop anymore. That's, that's the pushing hands. That's, let's go with that. People are, are aware that this isn't going to kill you, that it's not going to do anything. That might, oh, wait, now there's doctors talking about it has actual medicinal benefits. Let's go there. Let's keep pushing. Farm Aid, we, we have it. My son is on the National Hemp Board, um, our youngest son, Micah, and, and he's Johnny Hempseed, but his, his, his deal is educating people and, and showing them. I mean, he's in California, so it's easier. But 33 states now have some form of medical um, laws that are, you know, safe for people. That's another point we need to focus on. We have 33 states that we can push. The more we push for hemp legalization, the better it is for everybody. And I, I mean, starting from the, the, the person who handles the seed to the uh, uh, to the consumer. One thing I want to uh, jump in to underscore about what Annie said is that um, uh, the whole idea of like playing by the rules in the marketplace, but continuing to make sure that we come back to what we are all convicted is the truth when, when we're talking about the argument, when we're talking about the benefit, when we're talking about like the full reasons why, um, I think is a, is, is the balance that we're, we're like over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of progress. If we've been able to find past market, um, for products so people can try them, use them, experience them and, you know, benefit. Um, but we've also found that through, especially working with some of these like government agencies that need to talk to each other and to states and across, um, that that, um, that, 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 that it's incredibly important that that conversation be with, you know, whichever starting point of truth you want to start with, um, but include the full story. So I would just underscore that as like the kind of the, the two pieces. Yeah. yeah, I would do, I would do one more underscore and add a third layer. Um, it's to Annie's show. You have to show right now, especially on the hemp derived um, cannabinoid side safety. And it can be counterintuitive um, for big business um, to want to share with other stakeholders their secrets and their studies and what they're, because you know, you do a grass study, it's it's directed at your own CBD. It's not like you're talking about CBD generally. So in that world though, if, you ha if you're sitting on, on any data related to your own products that supports no liver toxicity, no reproductive toxicity, those same issues that the FDA keeps cutting and pasting and putting out again and again, um, you're not doing yourself any favors. That's right. Canopy has taken the taken action to listen to the FDA's call and we give them interim data around our studies. When our studies aren't even finished, we don't even know how the study is gonna end up and we're, we're giving it to them. Anything that we see that supports the safety of CBD, which they already know, it's already in the Epidiolex profile but the more we keep using the public dockets, putting it out there and being the squeaky wheel of like, you want reproductive toxicity data? Well, here you go. Here's some more. Here's, you want longevity study? Here's, here's more for that. Um, that will help to where we get closer to what I think will be the legislative fix, having the FDA um, not fight hard back against it. But we do have to have people who are amenable to hear it. And if we, can, if we can get that if we can make that happen by voting and knowing what your representatives think, you know, what's, which side is, are they on? And, and is, are they on a side, certain side, because they're getting funded for, to be on that side, or maybe they just don't understand. Either way, it requires a conversation and it should be had. It should be had by everybody. Everybody should know how the people representing them believe. Whichever side you're on, you should know that anyway. But in order to advance the more freedom in in uh, hemp and a more, you know, a, a more distributed purpose for hemp in this country and have it be valued, we we need to get people in there who will take that leap. And 
with us, you know, was like, here you are, like Kelly was saying, here's the information. What's holding you back? Let's jump together. I love that. Let's jump together and the persistence and persistence with, with facts and, and data and safety studies. And I think the more too we can unify and get those same facts and to our various state regulators and policymakers and have everyone kind of you know beating to the same drum and the better I think you know so much of the challenge is this patchwork of state regulations and people sort of operating off of different misconceptions and um, not even different sets of facts, different misconceptions, the more we can get real data and, uh, you know, get it heard loud and proud from, from various states and, and upwards federally, I think we can, can effectuate some real change here. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start taking a, a few questions here. We've got quite a few. Um, we're hearing from, from some farmers here, which is great. So we as farmers are very concerned about regulations around total THC compliance. Do you feel farmers are educated as to the difficulties they will face with the cultivars and how to efficiently harvest and store biomass? Um, are there any agencies that have taken the lead in, in this area? Are there any industries? Um, agencies, uh, private or public agencies that have taken the lead as far as educating farm farmers and, and finding good genetics and how to store and harvest hemp properly um, and finding reputable reputable actors on the, on the seed side. Us and the National Hemp Board, I think Kelly's company is doing it. We are. It's just, a, it's an edge. It's, it's got to come from everywhere. When we were in biodiesel, we used to say, you know, I used to say there's there's no silver bullet to the energy, the answer to energy, uh, to transportation energy, but there is silver buckshot. So it's all those things together, but there are places you can go. I think the National Hemp Board's a good place to start because you have an ally yeah. and they have legal too. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, form your own, form your own group and then take that to your legislator and but but there are resources out there and I would start with the National Hemp Board. I also have found the uh, the state departments of agriculture have done a good job in, in states that want to support the hemp industry. Texas has put together their hemp advisory council. California has one. I um, mean it, it, it brings stakeholders, farmers, um, everyone who's got any, any skin in the game to the table um, to talk about the issues and start creating this database where people can go that are interested um, in either starting or dealing with the new regulations, the IFR around testing. I know that the THC levels for us, you know, having that many plants around in 2019, that was, we we're sweating bullets. We got super close to the line in California in hotter climates, but even understanding that like, okay, hotter climates are going to yield higher THC, beautiful plants, but you got to be careful. Um, and then being able to work with your state departments of agriculture and in California, your local departments of agriculture, like however you're set up to create partnerships. And then, like I said, they have, they're starting to form their da databases as we're getting into the like, fourth growing season in the, the 4.0 of hemp. So definitely would check there. Yeah, and it's a great point. And there's also a lot of great state research institutions that are now doing um, great research as to what specific cultivars work best in, in different climates and a lot of the, the state specific considerations. And they're looking to hear from, from farmers and, and their own experiences. So I, I think the state resources, um, including the departments of ag and, and also the state industry organizations, you know, the state chapters of the national organizations are, are, are a great resource. I love this question um, because I feel like one of the, uh, the the pleasurable jobs I feel like I have um, being involved with Annie and Willie is that um, big fans and longtime supporters who share their beliefs want to talk to us all the time about their dreams in this industry. And so I backstage at Farm Aid or wherever we are get a chance to talk to people. And I think it's really important that we treat hemp farming as an opportunity 
but as a profession, the same way that all farming is a profession where there's a, you know, there's a technical set of resources needed in order to be successful. And definitely it's not, it, I, I, for, for, from what I've heard, seen uh, and experienced through real farmers, I am not one, I just grow tomatoes. Um, it is, uh, I think it's really important that we, that we bring that part of the conversation into this part of the conversation so that we don't send the signal that, hey, everyone should be farming hemp. Because I don't think that's the message, right? right? Like it's, a, it's, but it is this amazingly viable um, agricultural option for a lot of professional cultivators of other plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, another one, does anyone have any future plans for fiber plays in, in hemp? The question. For fiber? For, for fiber products. Oh. Uh, hemp fiber products. Ask Elon Musk. <laughs> 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 From our point of view, it's a great up. We, uh, we, we do a lot of um, source. We, when we look to source products, whether it's packaging or T-shirts that we put our, our logo on, um, hemp is some, at this point in our, our play, hemp is something that we look for in that fiber content. Um, but right now, we're pretty, we're pretty focused on our story and on, on our end of the stick. <laughs> and we are too, though. We're always looking for opportunities. Um, I think Annie's done a great job of ex describing how versatile this plant is and how many different ways you can use, you know, one plant of one crop. Um, and so how to use our, kind of, as we're manufacturing our products, our downstream um, biomass, the fiber that's coming out of our extractors once we've gotten the CBD out and we're moving into the isolate. We have biomass left over and we are looking um, and have been approached by others who are looking to manufacture products, textiles, uh, PPE, recent, most recently with that biomass. So I think that would be a fantastic use of something that we would otherwise be disposing. So we're, we're always open. And I would like to say it. too that, that uh, it, in regards to um, bio, like biofuel, um, our deal, even at Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance, was always food first. And then you have to calculate how much energy is it, does it take to, to get this, this oil compared to what it's, what it's putting out. Um, all of those things are really important, but our main credo is food first. So for that, because when we were trying to, this goes back to, we were talking about how to bring people in. We were talk when we were talking about, oh, we want to take this, this and make fuel with it. People were like, yeah, but we can, we can use that in food. We can eat that. And is it really sustainable if you're taking it out of that market? So there are things to balance, but there are, I, I wouldn't say um, hemp is the best um, fuel for, for making, per say, biodiesel, but it is a good one. And there are others, there are lots of them, but there's so many things you can do with a hemp plant that it's just, they're innumerable. And, and we have, I'm sure we're on the tip of what we can do with it. There's so much more, but at the same time, um, we need to do the, the things that are most obvious first, remediating soil, giving people CBD, for whatever they need it for, the bagasse for for you know uh, antimicrobial, antibacterial, um, uh, what do you call it? The um, shoot vocabulary bypass insulations, those kind of things for building for for textiles for and my my son grows and he makes the hemp rope and he he basically were his sweatshop making hemp twine. <laughs> But it's it's a little zen if you ever want to do it. It's kind of zen. It's kind of fun, but don't tell him I said that. Um, but anyway, it's it's you know so many things that that the idea of fiber being one thing or two things is is not even in the realm. It's it's myriad. There are myriad products that you can do from hemp, and we should be. Yeah, we should be. And I think we sort of know a lot of a lot of the potentials for what hemp fibers can make and there's a lot we don't know and we've only been able to research the plant since really 2014 and and most states didn't come on board with research till you know 2018 and, and some like like texas that california are only recently coming online so 
I, I think we're really just now entering the phase of, of what we're going to learn from this plant. And it's, it's so important that people start using the products that are out there now and, and understanding um, the plan and going back to just you know, ed educating people and distinguishing it from, from marijuana and empower, empowering its, its research and, and all its potential. Yeah, huge. Um, let's see, one last question. Um, have there been any efforts to connect with indigenous communities across North America who were growing hemp historically? For us, yes. Um, just it, uh, we, we have connections. My husband's been Indian of the year twice, but it's uh, also with Indian Nation that, that, um, that there's a whole different federal thing on their lands but they're they're fighting their own fight about growing hemp but they they could be a huge huge land source and huge um it can be really big for them i i i hope that you know there's there's room in this industry for everybody and i hope that they use that land for that first it needs to be remediated and secondly it's it's i mean you see casinos shut down right now that's their income that's their how they you know, run the the land and and how they send kids to school and do all those kind of things on those lands. But if they had a, a a crop that could also, obviously not on a casino level, but if they had a crop that they uh, they could allay some of that off on, you know, and that they had an income from something that made sense and not let like a debt is an owed, you know. <laughs> It'd be kind of nice to to have that happen. So we've been we were working with a few people, and and hopefully that will, will happen in a big way. That's yeah, I agree too. That's a great question, and I think it's really something that you know the, the industry will hopefully focus on more in the future, and, and doesn't get talked about enough um, today. So yeah, agree. I have a question. Thanks. Are you, are this, because I'm dying to know what that is hanging behind you, Kelly. Is that a chandelier? Mm -hmm. This is girls. So I, I want to know what that is. <laughs> it is a chandelier okay. and it's the, it's the mirror that's reflecting oh, back okay, to my okay. chandelier. I figured it was a mirror, but nice <laughs> cabinets, by the way. Thank you. M moved right before we all got sh sheltered in place in California. So oh, very, I'm very good pack. timing. Yep. Yeah. A lot of time to unpack. I know Elizabeth's room. <laughs> <Gap room. laughs> yeah, it's really nice and your painting back there sean oh yeah thank you it was a, a gift from a friend who painted it it was really nice thanks anyway, got it. we did interiors uh, too <laughs> no it's been i think it gives an extra extra touch to be able to see a little bit into everyone's home and it's just been extra special to to be with leading ladies and in, in hemp and advocacy and um i think it, it ended up being kind of a really more important time to have this conversation than it may have been um you know in austin and in, in early march and um thank you so much everyone for for your time and, and incredible insight and um if anyone has parting words i just like to echo what everyone said and what Annie said about voting, but please do get out there and and vote. And it's it's our biggest power we have. And um, every you know, local, state, federal, it, it all matters. We're disappearing. I just want to say thank you to everybody who actually tuned in to watch this because I number one hope hope you learned something. I hope it helped, and I really do hope you take whatever information you have or got or really have to give, either share it or go out and seek it and and talk to your representatives and start there. Start on your local level and move up. It does matter. It all matters. It does. I, I'll just echo that. Um, like I said, we're lighting the world on fire with these grassroots campaigns um, and we'll continue to fight the big fights on Capitol Hill, but it all starts with the individual. So absolutely.
Sean, thank you so much for getting us all together. I think this was um, this was great. I feel uh, lucky and really like that was that was a very enjoyable and much needed optimistic conversation. Yeah, I yeah. love all you ladies. <laughs> Same. It's nice to have girl time. <laughs> it's nice to have human time. <laughs> Honestly, I you guys are here. We had hella thunderstorm last night. I think there was a tornado nearby, but anyway, it just trashed everything and the hot water heater blew up <laughs> over there there's a guy we had a rattlesnake out here today but you know they do their function too it's just somewhere else you got to do it somewhere else and and we just the house just anyway so there's 50 people running through my house right now and my husband and son playing chess so thanks for putting up with us <laughs> Oh, happy birthday to Willie. It was extra special to, yes. to have you today. I'll tell him. And, and we've got, I think, California, Washington, Texas, and, and Colorado. So very cool to all be be able to connect. Yes. And Hawaii. <laughs> We're both. Yeah. Zoom happy hour next. Yes. Yeah. See you guys with the next hey, one. Go look up the, the hibiscus, the CBT infused hibiscus tea drink. I swear. I have. I will tested that with people. They love it. It's really good. It's on the Willie's Remedy site, but oh, that was shameless. It I'm is going. a shameless plug, but I'm telling you, you brought up happy hour, so that's why I said it. I'm going for it. <laughs> it's all about the happy hour. It's good. Hibiscus and vodka. You can also do tequila and then do a little rim with the, the lime or uh, lime infused salt and just do it on the... <sighs> Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. I know. I'll take that as my prescription for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. I mean, where are you going? What do you have to do? You know? Sheesh. I get to make bacon and eggs for birthday dinner, so lucky me. Anyway, thank you guys for having us. Thank you, Sean, for hosting, and thank you um, for, you know, sharing the space. I really feel honored. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. And thank you for listening, everybody out there. All right, take care, y'all. Thanks, everyone.